Thank you, dear brothers and sisters, and happy Lord's Day to you, and happy Mother's Day to all of you mothers. There are things that we know about God because we have seen it demonstrated by a mother, because we've seen self-sacrifice that comes from the image of God. Go with me this morning, I'm going to try to do this quickly, to Luke chapter 15, commonly referred to as the story of the prodigal son. It's more than that. It's the story of a certain man who had two sons. <clears throat> Let me first read to you from verse 1. Then drew near unto him all the publicans and sinners for to hear him. And the Pharisees and the scribes murmured, saying, This man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. Scribes and Pharisees were outraged that unclean people were coming, publicans and sinners. They should have rejoiced that these people would come to hear the word of God. But instead, they were outraged that he would receive them as if he should turn them away, as if he should reject them, shun them. They had the Pharisees and the religious leaders certainly communicated to the sinners that they, the Pharisees, were better than them. So they rejected them. They threw up barriers between them and the so-called sinner because the Pharisee perceives himself to be righteous. So the scribes and Pharisees, they complain against our Lord because he does something which to them is quite intimate. He eats with them. Not only does he receive them, he does something as intimate as share a bowl with them. They ought to be rejoicing they're not. So the Lord Jesus tells them a couple short parables about <clears throat> rejoicing. He tells them, in verse 3, He spake this parable unto them, saying, One man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, doth not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness and go after that which is lost until he find it. And when he hath found it, he layeth it on his shoulders and rejoicing. The shepherd, finding the lost sheep, rejoices. Then... He cometh home, and he calleth together his friends and neighbors, saying unto them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. I say unto you, that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth, more than over ninety and nine just persons which need no repenting. Rejoicing, he says, in heaven. So he informs the scribes and Pharisees that if they were like God, if they had anything in common with heaven, they would be rejoicing that the publicans and sinners are coming to hear. He told another one, he said in verse 8, either what woman having ten pieces of silver, if she loses one piece, doth not light a candle, sweep the house, and seek diligently till she find it. And when she hath found it, she calleth her friends and her neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me. <laughs> he said, Rejoice. She would say, Rejoice with me, for I have found the peace which I had lost. Likewise, I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner 
that repenteth. So he gave two parables to illustrate the heart of God and the sentiment of heaven that when sinners repent, heaven rejoices. So the publicans and sinners leaving their publicaning and their sinning to come and hear him was a good thing. But they could not see it that way. I have been, uh, every time I've visited here, once again, on this occasion, so blessed and so impressed with your pastor, his wife, every single member of the crew, Pastor Peter, Becky, the leadership of this church is <laughs> young. I know that's a relative term. Young to me. I didn't think that day would come, but sure enough, it has come. Well, I'm now talking about these young people. But it's a blessing to see those who are young spending their youth, spending their strength and their energy while they are young for the cause of Christ. They will not regret it. I can testify to you that the, in, the call of God came to me while I was young. I'm so grateful for how the Lord revealed himself to me and how he called me. And I also am grateful for the grace that he gave that I would respond to that call. And I have no, no, I've got regrets of actions I've taken, decisions I've made, but I do not regret spending my youth, which is clearly gone. I have no regret about spending my youth on the kingdom of God. Anything else is a waste. Anything else is wasteful. The word wasteful is where we get the word, I should say, the word prodigal is where we get the word wasteful. Prodigal living is wasteful living. Wasting time, wasting resources. Now we're going to hear, we find a story of a wasteful young man. And that begins in verse 11. Follow along, please. And he said a certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he divided unto them his living. Not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country and there wasted his substance with riotous living. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land and he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country. And he sent him into his fields to feed swine. I remind you the original audience, they were Jews. The characters in the story are Jews. The teacher telling the story is a Jew. And when he said, this kid got a job feeding swine. Can you imagine the horror? The gasps. Imagine the picture that that painted for every Jewish mother and father hearing the story. He sent him into his field to feed swine, and he would fain have filled his belly with the husks that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. And when he came to himself, all right, friends, I must pause reading right there. Brothers and sisters, all we read is when he came to himself. We don't know how he came to himself. We don't know how to make somebody come to themselves. When he finally came to a place of humility and realized that everything he had been doing was wasteful and sinful and 
end, the state that he was in was so bad and he was so hungry. And the only thing that had kept him from returning back toward his father's house had been his pride. It's the only thing that kept him. He didn't want to return as a failure. He did not want to walk back there in rags. His family ring was gone. He's now barefoot. He doesn't even have sandals. He did not wish to return to his father's house a total failure. Probably entertained the notion that he could recover all that he had wasted. That he could make something of, of himself. And Then also there's that older brother having to go back that way for that older brother to go look at you, you pathetic. When he finally came to the place of realizing that he is going to starve to death if he does not humble himself, when he came to himself, when he finally realized how stupid he was being, that's what we read right there. When he came to himself in verse 17, I must point out to you right now that there is no formula. There's no recipe. There's no steps to take in order to get somebody to come to themselves. If there were, that would have been a real nice place for the Lord to insert them. But there are some clues in this story, and I'll try to do it as quickly as I can. Reading on, verse 17 says, And when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my father's have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger. I will arise. I'll go to my father, and I will say unto my father, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and I'm no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me a servant. So he makes the determination that he will just admit it. Get up and go. Return to his father. Acknowledge that he is a disgrace to the family. He will acknowledge he's a sinner. I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm not worthy to be your son, but would you please Will you hire me? That's what he determined to go and do and say. Verse 20, and he arose. He did the very thing that he determined to do. He arose and he came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight, and I'm no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said to his servants, he, the, the son doesn't even get to finish the part where he was going to say, will you please just give me a job? Would you please hire me? His father interrupts him, calling to the servants, saying, bring forth the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. Bring hither the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and be merry. And can I point out to you that eating and being merry, they go together. Particularly eating meat and being merry. Killing the fatted calf, firing up the grill. That's how you be merry. Why? Why should we be merry? Why should we have the party? Why did he call the whole crew to end the work day and let's just party? Why? Verse 24. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found and they began to be merry. Now, typically... The preacher ends reading right there and just talks about the prodigal coming home. But there's more to the story, sadly. 
Verse 25 says, Now his elder son was in the field, and as he came and drew nigh to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants, and he asked what these things meant. What is the meaning of this? Right? And he said unto him, Thy brother is come, and thy father hath killed the fatted calf because he hath received him safe and sound. I draw your attention to the word received. He received your brother safe and sound. And I draw your attention back to how this began. In verse 2, Pharisees and scribes murmured, saying, This man receiveth sinners. You see what the Lord is doing. With this parable, he speaks of the heart of the Father, whom he acts and speaks as the representative of. He has received publicans and sinners. He has been criticized by the Pharisees for the very same verb used in the parable. He hath received him safe and sound. Verse 28. He was angry. Instead of rejoicing, the older brother was angry. Even as the scribes and Pharisees were angry at his receiving sinners. The older brother was angry and he would not go in. Therefore came his father out and entreated him. And he answering said to his father, Lo, these many years do I serve thee. This older brother does not have a right relationship with his father. He doesn't even see his father as his father, but as his employer. He sees himself as the earner of everything he's gotten from his father. You see this? All these years, many years, I've served you. Neither transgressed I at any time thy commandment, and yet you never gave me a kid you never even gave me a baby goat that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this, thy son was come, which hath devoured thy living with harlots, thou hast killed for him the fatted calf. This wasteful son, this prodigal, you have killed the fatted calf for him? You hear the jealousy. You see the, the envy that is being expressed by that older brother in the parable? Well, his father responded, verse 31. He said unto him, Son, thou art ever with me, and all that I have is thine. I can only imagine that father saying, How do you not know? Everything I have is yours. How could you say I've never gave you? even so much as a kid of a goat. Everything is yours. You see, the problem with the Pharisee, the problem with that older brother, is he doesn't know the goodness of his father. He doesn't know the goodness of all that he's been given. He thinks instead that he is deserving of, of, of everything that he has. Well, his father told him, in conclusion of the story, it was meet that we should make merry and be glad. For this thy brother was dead and is alive again and was lost and is found. Now let's review. There are a number of things that we could learn from this very good father. A number of things that I think would help us as we deal with prodigals. Let me ask you the question. How many of you have a prodigal? Put your hand up if you have a prodigal. Do you have a prodigal? 
All right, I know you do not understand the question I just asked, so I'll restate it because I know better. Listen to me. Look at me. How many of you have somebody in your life, maybe a child, or maybe it's a friend, it could even be a parent, a spouse, and they have deviated off of the right path and they are now living in a destructive and wasteful lifestyle and you're worried about them. How many of you have that person? You have a prodigal. All right. Well then, let's consider several things. Number one, let's consider the fact that this is a story of a man who has two sons. If you have a prodigal child, if you've got a prodigal son or a daughter, that is not the worst thing to have. The worst thing to have is that other kid. <laughs> now, I wish for all of you to be spared having a prodigal. You don't have to, but you may end up with a prodigal. It's so much better if your children receive the truth from you and, and apply it and walk in it. And you, I wish for all of you to know the joy of that kind of son or daughter. I am so proud of my daughter. I'm so proud of the man that she married and the ministry that they have to their children and to the world around them. I am so proud of my son in the faith, your pastor and his wife. And I've known her since she was a little four-year-old with squinty eyes when she smiled, which she still does. I'm so proud of Pastor Travis Carey and his wife Maddie. They are son and daughter to me in the faith. To have such, you remember my son, Ben, he was with me here last year, Big Ben. I'm so proud of the man he's become. And so, so gratifying to see him speaking and, uh, and living the truth that I've taught. I've taught to him and I've told him. I told him and I showed him and he received it. He's applying it. I'm so grateful. And I, and I wish that for all of you that you would know that joy. It's wonderful that your children and your grandchildren would be under your influence and follow the Lord. However, you may have a prodigal, in which case, let us take note together of what this father does and does not do. Number one, let me point out to you, this father does not lower the moral standards of his home. He does not compromise. He's not going to allow this younger son to live out his wasteful agenda there. Probably in the story, this youngest son knows that. Probably, it already goes without saying, to do the things that he intends to do that are completely wasteful and sinful, he's going to need to leave. He knows his father well enough to know that his father would say with Joshua, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. He won't compromise. He won't lower the moral standard. He won't do as so many silly American parents do when they say, well, at least we know where he is. He's up using poison in his bedroom, but he's not out in the gutter somewhere. We probably would be learning quicker if he were in the gutter somewhere. And so I'm telling you, the person who lowers the moral standard does not serve the prodigal by doing so. And the leavening of their whole house is what is going to be experienced. So number one, don't lower the standard. No compromise. No negotiating. That leads me to number two. This father was willing to let his son go. There are many parents who have a problem letting people go. Now maybe you, like me, had the reverse kind of a father who not only let you go, he booted you. He ran you off, threw you away. 
That's not what I'm suggesting this father did. This father let him go. His young son came to him and said, I want my inheritance now. Father, give me what falls to me. Now, the truth is, if he would wait for that day when his father passed, he would certainly receive more, assuming that this estate continues to prosper under his father's wise management. He would receive a greater inheritance if he waited. And his older brother, he will receive the double portion, the birthright. But still, this impatient and wasteful young man says, I'll take my cash now. And his father gives it to him. One of the reasons why his father gives to him his inheritance is because in that culture, they had a rite of passage. There was a line drawn on the timeline of a man's life where boyhood ends and you are ushered across that line by your father into manhood. There was nothing in between. There's no such thing as adolescence. The Apostle Paul speaks of his own bar mitzvah in 1 Corinthians 13 when he says, when I was a child, I thought, understood, and I spoke as a child. When I became a man, I put away childish things. There was no mention of adolescence. There was no blurry, confusing, gray, transitionary season where you're not allowed to be a man and you're not allowed to be a boy. The Jews had... For their sons, a bar mitzvah. For their daughters, a bat mitzvah. You were proven to know the commandments. You are now son of the commandments. That's what bar mitzvah means. Hmm. Modern humanity has abandoned those very important <coughs> traditions. Now, I will admit some of the traditions of our pagan uh, ancestors were brutal, especially for manhood. And maybe they involved tribal scars or suffering. But at the same time, you've got to understand the spirit behind much of the rite of passages was you've got to demonstrate your manhood. You've got to prove you're a, you're a man, you're brave, that you can keep your composure, not wimp out and run and, or cry. Well... I wish I had time to talk about that more, but I do not. I've got 16 minutes. Let's, let's just once again look at the fact that this father was willing to let his son go. Willing to let him go. Willing to acknowledge his free will. His freedom even to go and do what is wrong. His freedom to go and do what is stupid and get to experience the payment for stupidity, which is usually what we learn from. His father was willing to let his son go. We must be willing to let go. You've got to honor the free will of your adult children. You might need to revisit what is an adult, according to scripture, according to tradition, not according to the modern law. In America, you're a legal adult at 18. That is far too late for any sort of rite of passage. My son was informed that he is a man on his 13th birthday in a ceremony with all of the significant men in his life informing him, asking him first, what are the commands of God? Give us the 10. He told us the 10. How do you summarize with two commands the entire law of God? Number one, love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Number two, love your neighbor as yourself. How do you get to heaven? By what means are we saved? And he answered, with the word of God. He answered, we're saved by God's grace through faith. And that not of ourselves, it's a gift of God. He answered those questions which he'd already been given the answer to all 13 years leading up to that. When it was done, we all spoke blessing on his life. We prayed for him, and he was informed that he's a man. Now, he's still a man at 13, living in my house, a man in submission, a man under my authority. But he's a man, and it means a change has to take place in my relationship with him. Once you have ushered them over that line, you can't knock them back to boyhood. 
or girlhood and say, I take it back, I'm revoking your, your manhood. You can't do that. This father did not do that. He did not say, no, I'm not giving your, your inheritance to you because you're stupid and you'll waste it. I suspect that since the father in the story is actually representing God, he's wise enough to know his younger son is going to go and waste that money. But he sees that money, that inheritance, as tuition and a school of pain and humiliation that his son is choosing. No compromise. Leave the door open. I mean, be willing to let him go. My next point is, leave the door open. I got ahead of myself. Leave the door open. What does that mean? Well, fathers, I wish I had the time to tell you how very important it is that you and I say the things that we're supposed to say and that we do not say the things that we are not supposed to say. As a father, your words, and as a mother, carry much greater weight than you realize. You have a power, and it really is supernatural, and it is God-given, a power to bless and to positively affect your children. And you have the power to curse them. And I think it, it is a power that is overlooked and ignored. Every man who is a father, or every man who is going to be a father, listen to me, it is very, very important that you don't just follow the traditions of your family line. What if the traditions were stupid? What if they were cruel? Have you evaluated those traditions in light of the scriptures, in light of the word of God, in light of the command that fathers don't frustrate your children, don't exasperate your children, children, but bring them up in the fear and admonition of the Lord. One of the most frustrating things to any son or daughter is a father who only speaks correction. Oh, you've got to speak correction. You've got to reprove your children at times. But if that's the only thing you do is express your disapproval, and you don't express your approval. If you don't commend them, if you don't find something to praise, tell them that you're proud of them. Tell them that you love them. Demonstrate that you love them. But listen to me. It is very important that you recognize the good that they accomplish and that they know you recognized it. Well, that's very important. This particular father is the kind who does not slam the door behind his departing prodigal with harsh words. Words like, you're going to go blow this. I know that. You're going to do that because you're stupid. You're no son of mine. You're a disgrace. Words like that, would they would barricade that door. But instead, I'm telling you, this is a father who would bless his son he would send him out with a blessing of God. He's not going to bless his bad choices. He's not going to bless his immorality. He's not going to bless his sin or his wastefulness. But he's going to bless the person. He's going to say to his son, Son, I love you. And I know you know what is right. And I'll be looking for you. This door will be open. No compromise. He was willing to let him go. He no doubt left the door open. Number four, the fourth point, this is, I want you to think about this for a second. <laughs> he did not go after him. He did not chase after his son. He did not follow him to a far country and then plead with him to come home. He did not go there and knock his son out, tie him to a donkey, and bring him home and make him be good. Now, that probably sounds absurd to you. You're thinking, why would you even say that? Because those are the kind of things that this dad thinks. And I did. I actually thought it with my prodigal. What I testify to you today is what I learned dealing with my prodigal 
16 year old. My very first thought when he had taken his leave at the age of 16 is, well, I need to go find him and bring him home against his will, knock him out, throw him in the family wagon, handcuff him and bring him back and make him comply. I had a lot to learn back then. I was a younger man. But as I prayed about that plan, which actually was a plan, as I prayed about it, and the Lord called me to his word, and my Father in heaven reproved me. I did, under the leading of the Holy Spirit, go look for him, but it wasn't an order to bring him home or to talk him into coming home. That was not why I went. I realized that I had failed to give him a rite of passage. I had failed to confer manhood upon him. So I actually did take my journey. I found him three quarters of the way from where we lived. He was three quarters of the way to New York City and living with a bunch of wannabe gangsters. When I found him, he rightly assumed that I was there to take him by force back home and make him be good. I had to actually inform him that's not why I'm here. He was heading for the family wagon. He was going to go without a fight. He just hung his head and headed for the car. I had to step in front of him and tell him, Are you, you, I understand why you think that's why I came, but that's not why I'm here. I came here to let you go. I came here to inform you. You are no longer a boy. You answer to God. Now, I've got to tell you, his ceremony wasn't anything like his younger brother's ceremony because I had to learn everything off of him. It wasn't real ceremonial. It was just me talking to a boy, looking into that boy's eyes and saying, listen to me, you're a man. You know the will of God. You answer to God. You're not some runaway kid. You are a man. You're on your own, but you're a man. I cannot overstate, I don't think I can exaggerate, the dramatic reaction. I watched something that was, to me was on the level of a demonic exorcism. It was like the foul demon of adolescent teenage punk. Be gone! It was cast out. It was as if he had, his identity internally just changed. And all of a sudden, with the reception of that news, as he heard it and it registered with him, all of a sudden, he was looking at me as a man. And we stood face to face, eye to eye, man to man. And all of a sudden, he, just, he said to me, wow. It was, that was his first thing. Wow. Well then, can I get a ride back to our hometown there? I got to turn myself into the law. I have things I've got to answer for. That was very manly. It was profound. Now, all of his choices were not great. <laughs> and he still wasn't right with God, but he was a man. And he began to make a series of man choices that ultimately led to the man of God that he is today. He's a godly man today. Now, man, I'm very proud of. Now, <laughs> glory be to God for this one. Uh, let me just tell you, the father in our story did not chase after his son to interrupt the course that his son was choosing to take. May I at this point inform you of something you may not know. I'm talking about the, the child that you have told the truth to, the child of yours that you have prayed over, that you have, in fact, lived an example before. That child, at whatever season, who deviates from the course that you know is the straight and narrow, has not Generally, I'm speaking in generalizations, he has not taken a one-way deviation to the abyss. No. 
Now, my observation, I speak as a pastor of decades. I have observed it so many times. I have seen the surveys of, of organizations like Focus on the Family. They've verified these very same that more than 80% of those prodigals return, they actually take a big circuit and return to their family's beliefs and values, typically by the time they're 24 years old, 80% of them by the time they're 24. My observation is that those who pray and those who stand on the promises of God and, and live an example. Don't be a hypocrite and expect your prodigal is going to follow your hypocrisy. That's actually what they're doing in their hypocrisy. I'm telling you, it's a circuit. It's, it's a circuit that only seems to vary in size based on the stupidity of the individual prodigal. And how long does it take the prodigal to learn from suffering and humiliation. That father did not go after his son to interrupt the course. He wanted him to finish the course. So he did not go after his son. But what did he do? <laughs> he was looking down the road. I bet he was looking down the road every single day. I bet every day while he was doing work, he was keeping his eye on the horizon expecting that son will return. He was praying for him. He was trusting God. He was taking every tormenting, worry, thought captive into the obedience of, uh, of Christ. And on that note, with the two minutes I have left, let me address you mothers, because I don't know if you've noticed, but there's no mom mentioned in the story that we've read. Now, she's implied because the kid exists, Right? The story was illustrating how God is toward the returning sinner. But if there was a mother in the story, she suffers more than a father. She worries. Mothers are wired by God with a capacity to always be thinking about what could happen because it helps you keep toddlers alive. Because you always got to be a couple steps ahead of them. Always, as a mother, you got to think what could happen, what's the worst that can happen. You got to think in worst case scenario terms all the time. But if you keep doing that the rest of your life, you will drive yourself mad. You will go crazy if you haven't already. <laughs> and if you have gone crazy with your worries, you can, you can be healed of that if you'll just quit worrying. Don't entertain the movie in your head, picturing their suffering. I'm telling you, there is not anything that when they return, there's nothing they're going to return with that you and the Lord together can't handle. Trust the Lord to work in their story. And, you know, looking down the road, be expectant. And then when you see them return, humble and contrite, Run to them just like the father did in our story. Run to them. Run. Run, and, and it's the only time in the whole Bible you know that. You've been taught. It's the only time that we can see in any of the Lord's parables where God is portrayed as being in a hurry. And that, that's a culture where older men wore longer robes and people ran to them. When you're the father, you're the boss, and you've got hired servants, you speak and they run. You don't run. <laughs> well, this father did. Most undignified. Hiked his robe up in his belt and just started running. He was willing to make that statement. He fell on his son's neck and kissed him. He restored him. So what I have said this morning has not really been focused on the prodigals who may be sitting here among us. Uh, instead, my focus has been on all of you who love those prodigals. But let me address those prodigals, if I may, before we depart. Josh, you probably want to come on back up and band come. You guys do a song at the end, I assume. Let's transition into that. But I'm telling you, you, you prodigals. 
if you are, or if you have been a prodigal, but you have repented, I say to you, you are so very welcome as, as a brother, I say to you. I'm so glad you've come home to your father. But if you have not yet, you haven't come home to your father, if you've never acknowledged, if you've not come to that place of brokenness, where you say, I've sinned against you, God. I'm not worthy. None of us are worthy. If you will just come to him on those terms, the Son of God gave us the whole story just so we could know how God is with regard to receiving you. The Son of God said in John chapter 6, no one who comes to me will ever, under any circumstance, be cast out. He said, I will in no wise cast out anyone who comes to me. So if you will return to the Lord in humility and confess your sin, he restores, he forgives. He doesn't make you work your way back or earn your way back. If you start thinking in terms of earning and working, you're not being the returning prodigal. You're still acting like your older brother. He thinks he earns. He thinks in terms of works. Now you've got to receive your father's love as the gift that it is. Father, I pray for every man and woman in this place that you please open their eyes to your intense love for them. I pray for every single mother and father who has a prodigal. And I ask, Lord, that you give them the wisdom to apply the things that this story reveals to us. Give them the wisdom to stop torturing themselves. Give them the wisdom to stop torturing the prodigal with their endless uh, chasing after them and trying to stop them and trying to control them. I ask you, Lord, that you give us the wisdom to trust you to work in those people that we love. I pray all of this in the name of Christ, our King and Teacher. Amen.